Good morning. Thank you so much for your patience. And I am not Julie Pierce. Yeah. Just, just thought I'd mention that. Uh, we'll open this up, uh, convene the meeting. Public comments, members of the public are invited to address dresses it's this, this time. Is there anyone? Seeing no one come to the podium, I will ask for approval of minutes. So moved. I have a first. Second. Second. Call for vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, consent calendar. Is there anything to be removed from consent calendar? I do not do. No. Okay. I need a motion. I move that we approve the consent calendar. I have a first. Second. Second. Call for the vote. All in Aye. favor? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Regular agenda items. Legislative update. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. I was planning to give you a briefing on our Washington, D.C. trip, but I think the mayor stole my thunder at the last authority board meeting, so I won't uh, repeat that for you. Um, but it was, a, it was a great trip. Um, on the federal side of the house, we're continuing to monitor all the grant opportunities and um, monitor you know, what's, what's going to be happening with the reauthorization. Actually, at the board meeting next week, our federal advocate is going to be here and give a presentation about that to you. Um, so we'll hear more about that next week. And um, with that, I will turn it over to Mark Watts to give the state report. Good morning, chair and members, um, or vice chair and members. Uh, happy to be here. I'm just going to give you kind of a rundown on a couple of the bills that we've been very active in this year. And uh, I think you'll be pleased at some of the outcomes you're going to hear. So first of all, uh, AB 1475 by Rebecca Barakayan is the bill that started off as just CMGC for CCTA to do work for um, communities in this in this county. It's been since expanded, and it's more like the bill we originally wanted to see, and it's moving very, very well. Uh, we have a last-minute request from AGC for a tweak that will uh, clarify the role that contractors have, and I'm going to share that language when I see it later this morning. Um, at this point, uh, Mr. Grayson is considering putting this retention language in a bill of his own, and that bill is another bill that's sponsored by the Board of Supervisors that deals with the Iron Horse Trail. Uh, that bill is, is moving very well. It passed out of Senate Transportation Committee this week, and it's on its way to appropriations, and it's got the full support of both transportation chairs. So I'm starting to work with the administration um, to make sure that they're comfortable with that bill, and particularly if we do add in the retention uh, proceeds language that we've been seeking into that bill, we want to make sure that they're both acceptable to the administration. Um, I thought I'd mention that, and I applaud your action. Uh, there was a bill that was troubling to some of your members as well as the Board of Supervisors, and that was SB336 that dealt with transit and autonomous vehicles. If you remember that, it was going to mandate that you had to have somebody in the vehicle from the transit agency. Uh, and I wasn't tracking this, but all of a sudden one day I received a copy of uh, a post letter from the Transportation Authority as well as the Board of Supervisors. I immediately went across the street, shared it with their office, and the next day I got the word that since the county was concerned, they were going to put the bill over until next year. So that bill was set aside this year due largely, I think, in part to your uh, your strong and quick action on that on that measure. Uh, in addition, I know there's been questions and uh, uh, now I won't say concerns, but just questions about the progress that uh, the Assembly Local Government Chair Aguirre Curry is uh, in, in her pursuit of ACA one, which would reduce the vote threshold for infrastructure and transportation. It's still sitting on the Assembly floor. But I think they're getting ready to move it because yesterday in the local government or Senate Governance and Finance Committee in the Senate, uh, her companion bill, as AB 570, which spells out how it would be implemented if the ACA were passed, was approved by the Governance and Finance Committee. So that tells me they're getting ready to move the bill or the main constitutional amendment. But I have not confirmed that yet, but I'll, I'll keep uh, Lindsay abreast of that. Uh, in addition, uh, it was interesting sitting in government, governance and finance yesterday for about six hours because one of the other interesting bills that's floating along that affects you is AB 1487, which is Mr. Chu's bill that would provide 
the Bay Area Housing Finance Authority um, to either MTC, ABAC, or both, or some new entity. It's, uh, the bill was basically gutted so they could negotiate out how that would uh, move forward, um, what would be the governance structure. And I would also point out that the bill was, uh, before it was gutted, uh, they stripped out the sales tax as one of the options for that entity. So um, that, that there'll be a lot of activity over the summer. We'll be monitoring that for you and be able to give you an update as that bill comes out. Lastly, um, there's been a very furious but quiet uh, cat and dog fight behind the scenes over um, the local partnership program. The commission has been intent on implementing it in a certain way that is not consistent with what the chairs of the two transportation committees wanted. Um, Senator Bell has carried SB 277, which uh, now carries in it, was amended to have a new uh, mix of how the money would be distributed. So 85% would be distributed on a formulaic basis. 15% would be reserved for a competitive basis for small rural counties or counties that have uh, uniform development fees. So it would be 85-15, which is much closer to what uh, I think um, the staff here was looking for uh, earlier in the year. And I think it's going to be a now a, a major fight with the administration to uh, have the legislature try to impose the 85-15 on the on their on the uh, uh, administration, the uh, thing I would suggest is it would be very very uh, welcome by the two chairs if this authority did take a support position for the 85-15 um, formula, and I've drafted a, a recommended letter that we could play with if that's uh, if that's the choice of the uh, committee and the board. So that's my report for today. A lot of things going on. This is the week that deadlines for policy committees to meet and uh, the beginning of the summer recess starts when they gavel down this afternoon and they'll be back on August 12th. So that's my report for today. Any questions, comments? Thanks, Mark. And you're going to work, Lindsay, you're going to work with him in regards to the letter. I, we would love for that to be part of a, a motion to, and an action item. For this. <coughs> okay, then I'll entertain a. Oh, thanks, Lindsay. I was going to ask about <laughs> the procedure for the ask. And so we <coughs> can take that action here, and it doesn't need to wait for full board approval? It, you recommend it okay. to the full board, and then when the full board approves it, we would send a letter. I would think that was that. Okay, so I move that we... Um, support the request for the letter of support for SB 277 or hold on let me rephrase that I recommend that we recommend to the full board authority that we su uh, support a letter or submit a letter of support for SB 277 I will first second second but call for the vote all in favor aye aye thank you sir thank you take care uh, 14 0 draft measure 2019 measure J strategic plan Good morning mr. chairman and authority members this is an informational item today I want to give you an, a quick overview of the draft 2019 measure J strategic plan and get any comments you may have so we can incorporate in the final version we will come back to you to approve the final version in September the highlights of the plan are summarized in the staff report on page 14-4 of your packet. Uh, we started working on this update seven months ago in December 2018. As you recall, you provided us with direction on key issues that guided the development of this plan. The most important one was the revenue forecast. As you recall, in anticipation of a slowdown in the economy in the next 18 to 24 months, you approved a lower forecast than the prior strategic plan. When you take into account our revenues for this fiscal year, we will have about $136 million less than what the last strategic plan assumed. Uh, the challenge we had in this plan is how to absorb this reduction in our revenue without impacting ongoing projects. Uh, while taking into consideration sub-regional equity, existing commitments, and the fact that there aren't many projects left 
to be done in the strategic plan. With over two thirds of the projects completed or under construction, we uh, have limited choices where we can cut funding. Uh, to kick off the process, staff sent a letter to the RTPCs providing suggestions on where we can make funding cuts. Uh, the draft plan uh, reflects the input we got from all four RTPCs over the last several months. And I'm pleased to say for the most part they agreed with what staff suggested. Uh, the majority of the revenue reduction was absorbed by savings on completed projects like Highway 4 and the Caldecott Tunnel and future reserves that we, that we have not programmed yet to specific projects. So only three ongoing projects uh, in the strategic plan out of total of 90 projects uh, had funding reductions. Uh, these were Innovate 680, I-80 Central Phase 2, and Hercules Rail Station. The funding reductions are not expected to impact the pace of uh, the project development work underway on this project, uh, except for the Hercules Rail Station. For that project, uh, to, mitigate, to mitigate this impact, WICTAC recommended that we advance the programming of uh, half a million dollars from their share of the TLC program, future share of the TLC program. As you know, uh, issuing bonds against our future Major J revenue has been instrumental in allowing us to leverage our funds to deliver project early. The program of projects, uh, which is included in Appendix A in the strategic plan, reflects that almost 97% of our Major J projects fund are uh, programmed by fiscal year 25, by June 30th, 2025. That is nine years ahead of when the measure actually expires. Uh, in total, we have about $755 million in Major J funds, project funds, that will be used to build about 3.4 billion worth of projects by 2034. The plan does not contemplate issuance of additional bonds since we maxed out our bonding capacity with the issuance of the 2018 bonds. Uh, we may still issue bonds if opportunities present themselves to reduce our cost by restructuring or refinancing our debt. With the reduction in our revenue and the advancement of several major projects in the next two years like 684 and I-680 southbound HOV project, we expect to experience a period of constrained cash flow in fiscal year 2023 uh, 20, and 2024. The plan proposes holding off the programming of the next cycle of the TLC and the pet bike program until we do the next update of the strategic plan in year 2020, 2022. At that time, we will have a better uh, handle on our cash flow situation and it will give us the option, if we need to, to temporarily tap into that cash reserve set aside for these programs to get us through that period. So with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Questions for staff? Uh, Hussam, thanks. Actually, my question is to Brian. As a sub. I'd like to hear from your perspective, because obviously this started kind of before you were, you were sitting in the, the chief seat. Um, $7 million credit line, you know, that, that sounds like we're borrowing money to pay payments, just in case, or cover cash flow shortages of the assumption of the future. Could you maybe walk us through your thought process? What do you think, um, how these strategies line up? What are the risks? Um, and what do you think the net result's gonna be out of all of this? That's a great question. I spend a lot of time thinking about that occasionally. Um, historically, we, if you think back over the number of years, the budgets never come to fruition 100%. Right. So there's savings in there. Um, we do have several bonds outstanding based on when we issued them, like the 2012 bonds. There's, you know, they have a 10 year call on it. So in 2022, we could pay those off, restructure those. Um, we have a $100 million swap. Depending, you know, there's, there's some room in there. <clears throat> but say all of these projects turn out and we're going to build everything by 2025 or 2022, as we say. Um, we do have a lot of internal funding. And so what we would do is come forward to you and ask if we can do a fiscal policy of internal loans. So let's say the 
the ferry service or the ped bike or the TLC program um, has the $7 million in a combination of the two or three, um, we would do an internal loan and pay back those funding sources internally interest. So we would, you know, we would set up a, an in internal loan to make those payments and make sure. Um, worst case scenario is we would uh, go out and do commercial paper or have to make a decision to delay a project should you know, it, it not make fiscal sense. But we do, um, I personally think about that all the time and I'm trying to stay ahead of the curve on those and make sure we don't get there and have a big surprise. That's just what I wanted to hear. <laughs> if it keeps you awake at night, that means you're paying attention and I'm, I know you are. Um, you know, so my seat, uh, this is 268 pages of, of um, a detailed report, but it's largely driven by what the RTCP is. And as long as everybody is in agreement over this, we as the board are really here just to bless that because it, it's driven up from, from that sense. Um, it also highlights, I think, the good decision that we made in getting um, our new consultant on board and addressing sales tax, um, something I don't think we – we just made assumptions before and didn't look at it as closely. Now we're monitoring that deeply, a little more conservative approach. And I think that bodes well for the future. And, and is just as importantly as if we do a new tax measure, that really gives a lot of confidence. So we don't quite get to this. Um, but surprisingly, if you look backwards, we got through some of the worst times in our lifetime of downturn in revenues. And you don't see it, right? I mean, we don't really see that effect of that. So I think it's commendable to all of you in the way that you manage this. Um, and while this seems alarming a little bit to hear it given this way, I think it's just that forward thinking. And it really um, demonstrates that you really are looking at this, coming up with ways to make sure that this is seamless. And it makes it easier, I think, for here, uh, for those of us sitting on the board to make decisions. So um, I appreciate this. Um, and Hisham, is there any... Anything from any of the RTCPs on this? I mean, this is fed up from them as an agreement. Any of them disagreeing with any parts of this at this point? Great. Well done. Okay, thanks. I guess a question I would ask <clears throat> if this goes up to the board. We would probably preface explaining what could happen. Newell's question. What do you think? I'll preface it. Before. Yes, definitely. That we way, can do that. Yeah, uh, we can do that. Yeah, I think that would be apropos, Neil. Yeah, I no, I, I, I just raise it because I'm, I'm always looking at money and. Um, well, most cities. Do yeah, that. and and that's really what our job is: is to help, um, you know, listen, take advice, and help manage that. So, uh, with that, you know, I I don't personally have any other comments. Again, okay, provided that all of the RTCPs support this, then. I think we should recommend this to uh, move forward. So that's a motion? That's a motion. I have a first. Second. Second. Call the vote. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? 15-0. Interstate 680, State Route 4, interchange improvements. This would be Ivan. Good morning, Chair, uh, Board members. My name is Ivan Ramirez, and I'm the Director of Construction for the Authority. And uh, staff wanted to present a, an update of this construction project. As the uh, board is aware, the uh, construction program is going through its biggest phase where all the projects that are being administered by the uh, Authority. And uh, this project is the biggest project that we have awarded as an administering agency. And we want to show you some of the challenges that we have encountered so far and uh, we're prepared to answer any questions you might have. So a little bit of history. We issued in order to proceed on November 14th, 2018. So far, one of the first things that has impacted us is, is the weather. For planning purposes, we estimate 20 non-working days per season. Uh, last season, we encountered 70. That already put some stress on the overhead of administering this construction contract. And, uh, and again, I'm going to go over some of the issues that we have encountered. Uh, resolution 1859P for the construction contract, it was a, a total amount of $97,702,233 with a contingency of $8,882 and $20. 
So before we get into the issues, I'm going to give you an update. Unfortunately, because of Buchanan Airfield, we haven't been able to fly the drone because you need special permission given of uh, the uh, air traffic that occurs in the vicinity. So we're going to issue some uh, old actual photos from the ground. But uh, f basically what we're doing in the project is widening all the highway and the structures uh, along the corridor from Pacheco Boulevard all the way to 242. So right now this picture uh, is not very clear because of the shadow, but we're putting the foundations and the columns on the inside and outside of these structures and the falls will go pretty up pretty soon, quickly, pretty quickly here, as you say, and we're going to start building and connecting the, uh, the widening portion to the existing bridge. Uh, 680 bridge is the next one here that I'm going to demonstrate. And as you can, you know, this is probably the most familiar with everybody here since a lot of people use this intersection. And again, we're widening both the median and, and the outside of the structure. Next structure is uh, Grayson Creek. A reminder, this is the bridge, the only bridge in the project that is going to be replaced. This, uh, uh, the profile of this bridge needs to be raised. And uh, this is the critical path of the project. The contractor can only work uh, at both creeks, Grayson Creek and Walnut Creek, between the 15th of June and September 15th of any one year. So in this particular season, the contract has to widen uh, the structures and then put the new alignment in the new structure and then come back next year, demolish the remaining portion and build it up again and, and then build the final alignment. So uh, we have diverted the creek so the contractor can go in there and work. And uh, this is, uh, we're racing against time. Contractor right now is working Saturdays and sometimes Sundays. And again, that puts a little bit of stress on the uh, overhead for, the, for us who are administering this construction contract. Continuing on, uh, Solano Way, again, they're almost done with uh, reinforcement of, of the median and they're gonna start building the, the uh, false rock and the median so that they can widen the structure and the same on Peralta Road. Let's just give you an update of uh, the, all the bridges are currently being worked on except the Walnut Creek. They're gonna address Walnut Creek during the next uh, construction season. Um, so some of the issues that we have encountered, uh, they, they're related primarily to conditions that are different that were contemplated during the design phase. This is a difficult graph to read, but if you look, this is a, a right off out of the plan sheets where we're looking at it from the top and there is a existing pressure water line that needs to be relocated. Uh, and we were supposed to tie at this location and this is where the new line was supposed to be and we were supposed to abandon this line. Unfortunately, once we get out to the field, it was uh, determined that the actual tying location needs to occur here. And that has increased the cost to do this work because now we're working in a, a, an area that has a higher slope. In, in addition to that, we have to have different fittings with different angles. And we also had to work over an existing sewer line. So uh, again, this is a condition that was different than what was, what was in, uh, in contemplated during the design phase. An additional cost that occurred here is that the uh, Contra Costa Water District, who is the owner of this facility, asked us to do some additional changes once they recognized that we had to uh, a different tie-in. So that's how the final work is going to look. Uh, over at uh, uh, this is Solano Way. This is a, another different guy. Uh, this is an, again another plan, another plan view. The Two yellow blocks are supposed to be footprints, the footprints of the new footings for the widening of the bridge. And what that blue line that you see there is where we knew there was going to be a water line. So by the way the contract was bid and the way it was contemplated during the design phase, we were going to avoid that line altogether. It turned out that the water line is right next smack in the middle of the footing footprint. So this uh, extra work required, uh, you know, redesign and, and construction and, you know, it's delayed the contractor's operation. And uh, right now, the, the work, it's going to cost about $587,000. Since uh, one of the things to note uh, as I speak about this project and the other projects they have in construction currently is that when you ask for additional work, 
the competition is so fierce out there for labor that the prices are coming up very high. So over here in this particular uh, location, we had a hard time agreeing with the contractor on the cost. So we actually had to go and get three independent estimates so that we were pretty certain what where the costs were. And this is the cost as it came in to perform this uh, out-of-scope work. Ivan, can I ask you a question? Uh, the first one you presented, um, I don't have any questions on, and that's that you really can't. You know, a lot of the work that I do and on ground-up structures, um, when we get our surveys done, we also then get um, utility companies out there, and they come out and mark where all of their lines are. Now, water line is the easiest line to find. I mean, there are probably ones that are just as easy, but you can find those easy. This would indicate to me that nobody went out and did that. Is that the case? So, so the, the answer is that as during construction, uh, during the construction phase of the project, we by law have to call the utilities so no, that they come and mark them. No, I'm so, talking about, this, this goes back to plans. Why wasn't that exercise done? If you say, yeah, we're required, we know we're going to do it, why aren't we? Because we and our, our type of work we do is we would go out and have that done before we actually start our design because that's how you find that line. So why wasn't that done and why is it not a standard policy now? Because that's, again, easy to find. So, you know, uh, I, the, the way I will explain this is that there were was, there was some efforts done during the project to locate the existing utilities. I cannot really answer uh, why was it that at this particular location with this particular scope of work, that line was not accurately uh, estimated. All I can think of is if you look at, at the end of both the new work, you can see that there's a line, uh, the line is where it's supposed to be and the line is supposed to be on the other side. I presume that they just interpolated. Right, so that, that's my point. So the only places you have to check, we don't care um, east or west of that or north or south, I don't know what orientation, where the hell that line is. The only place you would check is where we're putting our foundations. That's the conflict. So the narrowness of finding that issue, we already know where it needs to be or it doesn't. So you only need to verify that section. So it seems that should be a standard policy where we're doing these projects. We're putting in foundations. You zone out so many feet, 50 feet, 100 feet from that area. We zone out and intensely go look at that. And that should be part of the design contracts to do that. Because otherwise, we are, we're finding it out later, and we wouldn't be sitting here. And that is an expensive change. And I get it. We've got to pay for it. We've got to do it. But I would hope that the lesson here is that we should invest in that inexpensive work. So, so I'm going to answer a little bit. This has been a topic of discussion with right. our executive director and our deputy executive director. And I think that we, going forward, I think we're going to approach it differently than the way it has been approached. I, I, I really cannot answer, you know, a lot of the, the by the way, the questions you asked are the same question I asked, right? I have to deal with this problem. Uh, that's why I like you so much. <laughs> no kidding. My, it, 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 it's there in front of me, and I have to find a way to get it as quick and as, as uh, inexpensive as possible. But we have had those discussions internally, and, and I, I believe that going forward, including with the new projects that are currently in the planning, and design phase, including the northbound 680 project and, and other ones that we're going to be doing for Iron Horse Trail, we're going to look at how we do these utilities differently than it's yeah, been done it's in the great. And, and it's worth the investment. I know it slows the project down, but boy, in the long run, as you know, because you're, you're so good at fixing these problems, analyzing them, and then knowing. Um, glad to hear that. I think that's a, a great approach. Thanks. Yeah, there's a new discipline called SU. I think it's Subsurface Utility Engineering, but S-U-E. And, and so we're going to add more effort on the design side because at the end of the day, it's all about risk. And so we're trying to mitigate the risk. And so this is not, this is not the first project that this has cropped up on. And so we're going to try to spend more time in the design phase of potholing to make sure. Don't pothole the ends. As you say, pothole, we're going to build a darn bridge. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, the next one is uh, is removal. We've got to do some removal of some existing barrier rails, concrete barrier rails. And, and this one, there's really nothing they could have done at the design phase because the asphalt, the only thing that we could really use to plan this work, estimated there was going to be a void. When they constructed this wall, it was going to have some void in the middle. Well, it turns out that the, it's filled in with concrete. 
And you know what makes it somewhat expensive is that this ha this work happens to it needs to be done at night for public convenience and for safety. So that brings uh, with it you know uh, lane closures and another type of ancillary work that needs to support the main operation. So, uh, but anyway, this is another condition that uh, is different than what we uh, contemplated during the design phase. And, and again, I'm trying just to give you a flavor of the issues that we have in Condor. We have 55 change orders. Some of them are small, some of them are large, but I just want to give you a flavor of some of the things that we have in Condor and, and why uh, in my last slide I will show you where we are in respect to the to the budget of this construction contract. So um, as you well know, we are within range of the uh, flying uh, paths of the, of the Buchanan airfield. And what happened in this particular case is during the design phase, we actually reached out to FAA, the airport. They gave us these, uh, they call them determinations. And the determination stated that we could have a 120 foot crane at those locations uh, to do the work and that all we had to do was notify the airport uh, and put a, what they call a notice to airmen so the people that are flying in and out of the airport know that there's going to be a temporary obstruction. Well, uh, surely enough, we started work and the airport grew very concerned about the fact that we had 120 foot cranes right in the path of their, of their, um, the aircraft coming in and out of the airport. So, you know, basically they told us you need to lower it, you have no permission to do this, and that created a series of communications between Caltrans Aeronautics, uh, attempts to communicate with the FAA, but the FAA was during shutdown at this time. I don't know if you remember, there was a minor shutdown last year. So nobody could get a hold of the FAA, the airport, and us to try and figure out, okay, we know that we can operate these cranes here because we have these determinations in the airport. Was here, but you can do that, but it's very unsafe. So we had to stop the contractor. We had to be creative as to how we're going to approach this work. In addition to that, we were, we were within our rights to have the airport tore down a system called PAPI, and that system is the system that um, pilots use when there's low visibility or they want to they approach the runway at night. And the airport was very concerned that we turn that off for a year, which, we, again, we were within our rights to do. So in a nutshell, we had to work with uh, Caltrans Aeronautics, the FAA, the airport, the contractor, to find a way to solve this problem. And ultimately we did. It impacted the contractor's operation because the crane was already there. They had to lower it, they had to move it, they had to create, bring a different crane. They, we also impacted their means and methods ultimately, and that created uh, this change order. In addition to that, there are temporary lighting and, and sign structures that needed, and also permanent lighting and sign structures that needed to be lowered. So we had originally, again, estimated, I think it was 21 feet, and uh, it was too high for, for the comfort level. So we also, there's two additional change orders related to uh, airspace at, at Buchanan Airfield. But, but I do want to say that in the end, everybody came together. You know, I cannot say enough good things about the airport. The communication with the airport was great, and we continue to work closely with them. So with that, again, I'm just trying to give you a flavor of some of the issues that we have encountered. Uh, right now, if you look at the contingency, we have spent about 36%, whereas the, uh, the within scope work, where I charge the bid items, it's currently at 22%. So we're a little bit ahead. Uh, we still need to quantify if there are any delays to the construction contract related to a number of issues. So we're continuing those discussions with the contractor, and that's something that uh, we're looking very closely. And if we have to mitigate some delays, then that's something that we're also going to be looking at, if it makes sense from a financial and the public uh, convenience of finishing on time or, or even uh, earlier. So I'm happy to answer any questions at this point. And again, we just wanted to give you an update on uh, where we stand. How Did you put that chart back up there? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Ivan, first of all, I trust you absolutely implicitly. You are, you dig deep and as you uh, indicated after my other question, you find out the problem, identify it, then you find out the solution, and then you find out a way to set a policy to, to make sure. I, I think the rest of these things are, are fairly straightforward. Um, you know, there, there are things that happen in the course of things, 
Uh, it just looks a little um, misleading on that. I think that 22% is indicating that's the completion of the original $86,000 construction. That's correct. Right, $86 million, sorry. But it, it doesn't, you would have to have knowledge to look at that chart. When you start looking at that, it almost looks as though you're thinking this is a change order column. I was just saying graphically the way you're presenting this. The change orders to date are 3.185. So, so that and, and you're about 50% of the burn rate. You're, you're a little out of, out of proportion to the completion of the contract, to the burn rate on our contingency. But generally speaking, those are going to show up probably right about now. So that, to me, is okay. Um, 70 days of rain delay. Who makes that determination? Who's so, the actual entity and what's the criteria? Because those are, those are those are expensive things, and they're really there's some subject, subjectivity to it, and there's also motivations to it on both sides. So the way it works is the contractor requests that a rain day is given, and and the way the spec is written, it's it's a, it's a little bit um, I don't know how to say it. maybe it's not. Uh, dry, uh, uh, dry cut as it should be. But the contractor, if he works on the, if it's raining and he works in the controlling operation, he doesn't get a rain day. But if uh, if the oper the controlling operation cannot be uh, worked on because it's raining or or because of what happens after the rain, for, for instance, an example is at the beginning of the project they're still creating their access roads, they're bringing the heavy equipment, and a lot of rain days are given because the ground is not hard enough to be able to create a, an efficient operation for them. So you really have to wait for the storm to pass, and then you have to wait for it to dry enough. What happened last season was that just as it was drying, you will get another drying event. So, so that's the way the, the, uh, the uh, controlling operation determines whether you're going to have a rain day or not. A contractor is allowed to do work that is not in the controlling operation even though it's raining. So there's some discussion. The answer to your question is contractor proposes. Our resident engineer that we hire through the CM, and sometimes we have to consult with uh, Chris Cole, our, our oversight engineer, and uh, and see if, uh, if it makes sense that what the contractor is requesting. Uh, but the, the reason why it's 70 days is because it wasn't just rain events, but also what follow up with the rain events. OK. I, I was just going to suggest, because we've seen we got more rain. That's probably what the future is going to look like in this area. And we get rain, it's pretty intense, that adding into the scope of work to make the contractor responsible to rock base those areas so you can keep them accessible. I mean, the rock base we're using are, I can't remember what the class is called, but it's, it's like four inch. Right. And it allows that site, even though that sub base is a mess, just for the access. I can get it for foundations in the new work. You've got to have those done appropriately. But it might be worth to think about this in the future, how to maybe tweak that a bit, um, because this hurts all of us. Um, so I want to I address that point, because sometimes we do that. Sometimes we, we actually put some rock. And, and, and quite frankly, as part of our uh, stormwater control, we have to put it so that the, when the wheels come out of the site, they're not picking they, up the mark. But yeah. so sometimes we do that, but, but it, it really becomes a... An, it, it's difficult because if you throw the rock, it doesn't rain again. You know, so it becomes an, an issue. You have to evaluate and and take some benefit. risks. Sure. And, and but yeah, so but we do that from time to time, Mr. Anderson. That, okay. That's something that I want to tell you that we, okay. we look at it. Great, thank you. Otherwise, from my perspective, I, I appreciate the update. It's better to know early than late, and I think that's a good policy. Um, but I think where we're at, given. You know, other than the waterline thing, and I think that's a solvable thing, probably we can eliminate 90% of those in the future with some changes that you're suggesting. Um, but these other things, those are, you know, we're working on really old infrastructure that um, was back in the day still of paper plans. They either exist or they don't, and they weren't very good. They are pretty doggone schematic. And um, so I think, you know, given where we're at, you know, as long as we're... we're you know, as long as you're on this and you're forward thinking about all of the other things that might come up, um, you know, I think this is a good update. I feel comfortable where we're at and, you know, would recommend that we move forward on this. Thank, thank you. 
Commissioners, I just want to, I want to add one thing, a couple of things. One, K-Rail installation, if it's raining and you got a high-speed facility, you don't go out there. So we don't want the contractor, you don't want the contractor out there putting K-Rail up, temporary striping, moving traffic over. We just don't do it. Change orders are also for supplemental funds, so things like traffic control. We have we estimate how much we think we're going to need, so we write it. So change orders aren't all, aren't all just out of the contingency. State first material and... Uh, and supplemental funds where we know we're going to need to do something we just don't know how much so we estimate it we write a change order and we add to that change order as needed so those are some of the other contract change orders but we wanted to brief you because the southbound 680 project is going great 22 percent of the money spent 22 percent of the time this one has been a little bit more difficult and we wanted just wanted to show you what was going on so thank you and, and chris cole is here and so chris and jim reed are kind of your extension of, of staff to us representing the owner managing the CM firm. So uh, him and Jim are doing a great job as well. You disappeared on me, Ivan. But, <laughs> uh, that's, well, well, that's all right. I'm, I'm used to that. Uh, but I found you. It's twice you've disappeared over the day. My apologies. Uh, no. Uh, do you vaguely remember on the San Pablo where the people were using they weren't obeying whatever we wanted them to obey. Uh, yes. What happened on that? Do you remember, did we, the highway patrol was not patrolling? Oh, it? you know, so, so that's an interesting question. So, so I have, I've not really followed up because, the, and the reason I haven't done that is because that became an operational issue now where Caltrans took ownership. But what I can tell you is that uh, CHP ended up showing up here during regular board meetings, and they heard my presentation where I was showing the video. And they, they talked to, to Chris Cole, actually, who was here, and they said, by the way, we, I took notes of that, and we're going to go out there and, and do some enforcement. I haven't followed up on that, but I, I'd be happy to do it and have an update for you by the board meeting if that's something that you would like to know what's going on with that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but but yeah, I just remember it was a it was a big thing. But the object was, so is it finished? So that part of it is done. It's all done, and and um, it it is all done, and it has improved the operation of the intersection. But it would be at the time at the time I gave the presentation because again I have not follow up closely on it. But at the time the improvements would have been a lot better had people obeyed that no left turn sign. Right, okay. And that's, that was an enforcement issue. Okay, and then the last question to a novice, to you and, and, and um, my partner to my left, would you tell me how much contingency we had left? Uh, over here? At yes. this project? Five million. Yeah, I think, I think it's about $5 million of contingency, and that's for the unknown. Okay. For the unknowns. It was 8.8? .8. It was a... Can you can you move the mouse? Because this is the last slide that's. Sitting. Big savings. So, what was, what was the big savings? No, this was, it was a little confusing over. on that. We have about five million left. Okay, so in in our, in our perspective, do you think we're gonna that's gonna be enough contingency? I, I guess that's what I would. I, I think I think as we sit here right now, I think that I, I will be reluctant to say that we're not going to finish within contingency. Uh, yes. Right. So and, and and good news is you know we're getting out of the ground. You know I think the ground and connecting to the existing structures we already have identified a lot of that on the work. So as of right now, I was telling Randy and, and Tim that you know I don't feel that it's, it, we're necessarily thinking we're going to go over it, but it's a good time to also uh, present it to you. To, okay. So that you know the risk, but 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 I don't think so at this point. Okay, then my last question, and again I learn every time I ask questions because if you don't ask, you don't know. But the one that they're going to work <laughs> four months and then take it, come back four, eight months later, whatever, does that price go up to the contractor as as goods go up or as labor goes up? So that's the portion of the work where the con that's the risk that the contractor takes uh, as when so we put out the So that's all contract. on the contractor. That that will be on the contractor. Hopefully, he will think and uh, and he estimate those 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 he, escalation costs. He goes an escalation over the length of Except the for oil. job, the number of the labor time. That's right. Yeah, there's one. There's only uh, Randy reminded me that there's one item that that we actually have in our specs that we can that we will adjust, and that's the price of oil. 
So if they're paving, if there's asphalt, and asphalt has a percentage of oil in there, if price goes up or price goes down, we, we I think it's about 5% or below percent from what they bid. And there's an ongoing uh, tracking of that at a Caltrans website, and that's the one we use. So there's been times where we have taken money back from the contractor because the price of oil went down, and there are times where we actually have to pay. And that's part of the supplemental funds in there that we estimate we're going to spend some money for that. That is the only item. Other than that, it's all on the contract. All on the contract. Okay. All right. So you're, you're okay now? Oh, I think, yeah. Okay. This is okay. just information. Just all right. Information. Right. It was just information. All right. Uh, we'll move uh, connected vehicle, autonomous vehicle program, an MOU. Uh, good morning, Chair Taylor and committee members. My name is Jack Hall. I'm going to give you um, the ITS CVAV program manager for CCTA. This morning, I'm going to give you an update on Gomentum Station activities and seek approval of an MOU between the City of Concord and CCTA concerning the use of the closed Concord Naval Weapons Station for testing connected vehicle technology and autonomous vehicles. So first, some background on Gomentum Station. The base is a World War II era facility decommissioned in the mid 2000s. We, CCTA, secured access to test advanced technology vehicles in 2014 and created what is now known as Gomentum Station. And AAA Northern California, Nevada, and Utah became the managing partner of Gomentum Station in August of 2018. Our goals align well with AAA with the overall goal to operate a premier connected and automated vehicle test facility to advance the safe development, demonstration, and deployment of self-driving technologies. The map in the upper right corner shows the routes that we currently test on. This area includes 19 miles of roadway, both urban and rural settings, various speed and lane scenarios, five distinct testing zones, tunnels and overpasses, garage and workshop, office space, and secure site access. General features include one to three lane road uh, roads, 40 plus intersections, railroad crossings, 15 to 55 mile per hour posted speed limits, hard and soft shoulders, new and aged pavement. Um, and specific features that all conform to the man manual on uniform traffic control devices include bi-directional and unidirectional travel, three signalized intersections, one with protected left turns, double yellow lines, broken yellow lines, broken white lines, uh, streets with and without shoulder striping, two into one merge, two 1,400 foot tunnels, bike lanes, bike sharrows, a 10 foot residential traffic circle, standard pedestrian crosswalks, raised pedestrian crosswalks, no left right turn intersections, and bot dots lane shifts. For vehicle testing, we have four, act, uh, four active articulating pedestrian targets, four static bicycle targets, four active heated deer targets, a bicycle and helmet for human riders, one 100 traffic cones from 18 to 28 inches, a reflective and standard, and other amenities include co-working spaces for up to 10, event space for up to 50, internet connectivity, garage and workspace, and, su and a support pickup truck with flashing lights. This slide shows some of the equipment located in Bunker City. Uh, plans for the future include installing a 120-foot diameter traffic circle, a vehicle dynamics area, simulated highway on-ramp, smart signal lab that is DSRC based, GPS base station, and soft car targets. So here are the pictures of some of the equipment in the firehouse that was just described. And we are announcing our newest partners soon, uh, but we don't have authorization to go public yet. Uh, their first uh, uh, their first testing day is projected for August 1st. Uh, this company has completed 10 million miles of driving on public roads and over 7 billion uh, simulation miles and could be considered the leader of autonomous vehicles. No worries. So anyway.
question, comments. Uh, well, question, comment. Is there anything in this contract that is um, so? Yeah. We're, so this MOU, it um, we had five automobile manufacturers and two trucks, and now we're up to twelve. And then we had a one-year guarantee. Now we have five-year guarantee. Well, I mean, as much as you can get a guarantee in an MOU. Yes, it's, it's worked out, and, and AAA is actually doing a very good job. We're going to have, um, it's called Envoy. They're going to have an a iPad out at the site. And you, it's just like when you go to, say, a Toyota or some big company, you sign in and sign out. The, commissioners, the other update is we, as you know, the land that's to the east of the creek going up into the mountains is going to be conveyed this weekend. There's a ceremony to the East Bay Regional Park District. So we've had a, a couple of meetings with East Bay Regional Park District. And what I love about Bob Doyle, the general manager, is he can see the future and he wants to integrate the next generation of technology, the clean vehicle components into getting the patrons and or the people that want to visit the park into the park with electronic self-driving vehicles that could tell them about the history of the park, what they're seeing, and then move them in and out and park outside of the park, much like I think what Yosemite was trying to do a long time ago is because they got so many cars in the valley. He's trying to figure out how to use this next generation of technology to make access to the park even better. And so Jack has sent them a draft MOU to get us access because Kinney Boulevard, that 55-mile-an-hour test, that's going to be under the um, – purview of the park district now and not under the city of Concord. And so we've got, we're trying to be as proactive as possible. So we have an MOU in with the park district. I need a second. Second. Okay. We'll, we'll call for, for the vote. All in favor. Aye. 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 Opposed? Done. Okay. 17 Innovate 680. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. My name is Tim Hale, the Deputy Executive Director for Projects, and I'm here to give you an update on the Innovate 680 program and also um, awarding contracts for procurement for our strategic development management and quarter-wide support services. Um, I just want to give a quick update and background on Innovate 680. So Innovate 680 is our seven-pronged approach, which I'll cover those on the next slide, but the goals of Innovate 680 is really focused on share mobility, mode shift, and person throughput. So this is a project that everyone recognizes that there's the facilities at 680, 680 corridor is very constrained, and we need to look for innovative, uh, comprehensive uh, way of, of solving congestion on the 680 corridor. And so through the development of multiple studies, the initial study was the I I680 um, uh, transit congestion relief study, as well as a design alternative assessment to look at some of the congestion hotspots and bottlenecks in the corridor, uh, bus on shoulder feasibility study, ramp metering feasibility study, and all of those studies and even additional work we've done since then has really culminated into these seven strategies. And so I wasn't going to go into much detail on each of the strategies, um, but the first two strategies really focus on uh, cooling the corridor hotspots and addressing bottlenecks along the corridor, um, such as uh, the 24 interchange and adding additional auxiliary lanes at, along 680 corridor to address operational issues, as well as completing in, um, the gap of the HOV lane, the seven mile gap that goes from 242, or actually from Red Gear all the way up to 242, which would then thereby complete the northbound express lanes for the entire corridor. 
Um, the third strategy is uh, the part-time uh, transit lane bus on shoulder project that we're working on, as well as increasing the, the connectivity for transit through a network of shared mobility hubs, park and rides, um, and also at, at BART stations. Uh, the fourth strategy is innovative operational strategies, and so this is really looking at next generation integrated corridor management techniques. Um, I kind of kind of describe this as the I-80 smart corridor is kind of Gen One of ICM, and and this is looking at next generation in terms of dishes and support systems, and and being able to take real time data and information in the corridor and really tweak the system to really be predict predictive and proactive in managing congestion. Uh, the fifth strategy is preparing the quarter for the future. So this is really looking at the connected and autonomous vehicle, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure type connectivity through dedicated short range communication systems, as well as 5G. And the sixth strategy, the last two strategies are really, really key to the overall approach. Um, uh, the first and last mile connection, so having the, the infrastructure and the connectivity and the technologies, um, as well as a network of shared mobility hubs to really bring extend that access to transit and other mobility options directly to people to more effectively efficiently bring them down to the corridor as well as the seventh strategy which is once you have all these strategies in place you need a way to manage them and so this was and i'll talk a little bit about this but this is the transportation demand management strategy which is um the uh, bay area mobility as a service platform in terms of having that that mobile application the data engine and the support and the mobility options to really support um, um, having that seamless mobility journey in the 680 corridor. So right now this is our overall project schedule which we are working on as we speak. Um, in 2018 we initiated uh, working on the southbound express lane project which is under construction um, and we also have um, deployed pilots with miles and scoop to help enhance some of the TDM strategies as well as looking at over the next over the next immediate next years um, looking at um, deploying some of our initial innovative operational strategies such as adaptive ramp metering as well as continuing testing the shared autonomous vehicle which is really a, a really a, a linchpin in our um, or, or a, a, one of the key components of our first and last mile concepts um, the, the the next couple years after that we're looking at implementing the rest of the advanced technologies as well as um, deploying the shared Thomas vehicle and implementing the part-time transit lane. So if, if I was going to ask what you're going to see in terms of first deployments in the corridor as it relates to the overall strategy is really going to be the adaptive ramp metering as well as the, um, uh, the part-time transit lane in the corridor. And then later on in 2023 and 2025 um, through the northbound express lane, we're going to be looking at completing the express lanes and, and really solving those bottlenecks in the corridor. So looking at some of the funding opportunities, that we are looking at. These are uh, regional measure three just recently um, passed last year has uh, 75 million from the express lane category as well as 10 million uh, slated for this project as well as other state funds that will be will be available um, that will be applying for in 2019 through solution and congestion corridor as well as other funding opportunities. And so through those funding opportunities, this is our proposed funding plan. Um, the total seven strategies is, is about $510 million investment. So we're looking at essentially $145 million of state, $115 of regional, and $215 of local, which $250 of local is really key to uh, passing a future measure, which we've allocated $200 million um, to really bring this uh, entire funding plan um, to a whole. So that's a quick update on Innovate 680. So we've recently we've spent a lot of time on trying to really figure out, okay, how do we take these seven strategies and really deliver the first, first truly connected corridor in the Bay Area and so we looked at these seven strategies and developed four projects. And so these four projects, the first one is the advanced technology project. So this is all things technologies in the corridor. So this is essentially strategies uh, four through seven. So the innovative operational strategies prepare the corridor for the future, as well as components of the shared mobility hubs, because there will be technology associated with that. And then as well as the Bay Area Mobility as a Service Platform. Um, bus on shoulder is the part-time transit, essentially the capital. Um, that's really being put into the corridor to accommodate that new, frequent, efficient bus service in the corridor. The, the, the one on the bottom is the northbound express lanes project, and the one on the, on the far left is all of the transit improvements. So this would be the shared mobility hubs, um, the operations money, also as well as rolling capital for the project. 
So where are we today on this overall program? So we've been spending a lot of time over the last couple years um, getting all of the necessary components and really setting the foundation for the entire program. Um, the executive steering committee is in place. Um, the policy advisory committee and the technical advisory committee is now in place, and that was determined by the regional transportation planning committees. We are working closely with Caltrans um, and the strategic development team once they get, once they get on board um, to develop a program charter, which will outline kind of the roles and responsibilities between Caltrans and, and, and CCTA as well, and that will actually lead into a master cooperative agreement for the entire corridor. And then we also have a number of Caltrans cooperative agreements for the various projects. We have a cooperative agreement for the northbound express lanes. We have a, a cooperative agreement for the advanced technology project as well as the part-time transit lane. Um, as you all know, we've been uh, awarded an $8 million grant on the ATC MTD for the Bay Area Mobility on Demand grant, and so that's essential to that seventh strategy. And then we also submitted a grant to USDOT for the automated driving system grant for about $9.5 million, and that's really a component of preparing the quarter for the future for that vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure. And, and so that grant has three demonstrations, of which one of those demonstrations is specific to the 680 corridor and, and Innovate 680. We also have undergone um, a number of consultant selections. We've selected Kimley Horn for the part time transit lane project, and that is ongoing. We also, at the last board meeting, um, in June, we awarded a contract to HDR for the Northbound Express Lanes project. We are undergoing a procurement right now for Share Mobility Hubs, and we also, over the last six months, have gone through a procurement for the strategic development team, and that's what I'm here to talk about today. Um, we've developed this integrated innovation team to really manage the overall program. This is a very complex program. It's got a lot of pieces and components to it, and so we, kind of starting from the top down, we, uh, I've already talked about the Executive Steering Committee and the PAC and the TAC. Um, program Leadership Team, that's essentially people like myself and my peers among some of the partnering agencies and, and partners along the corridor, as well as the Strategic Development Team. On the, so the Strategic Development Team is the corridor manager and the Strategic Development Team on the right-hand side. And so one unique aspect of delivering this project is that if you look at the bottom, there's a series of projects. And so traditionally what you would do is you would – you know, hire a public engagement firm, a traffic firm uh, for all of these independently. And so because we're trying to maintain the overall uh, vision, the goals, and also keeping making sure the seven strategies stay cohesive as we're delivering all these projects, we decided to kind of pull up um, some specific disciplines to make sure that that stays cohesive across all the projects. And so that's why, that's why we called this the strategic development team, which consists of public engagement to make sure that that, that, that that message stays consistent across all the projects, as well as traffic modeling. So making sure the, the assumptions and everything, the key, the KPI, key performance indicators really stay consistent across all the projects. And then the system management is really key because making sure all the technologies, for example, you have express lanes in the northbound express lanes project, the part-time transit lane, you're going to have technologies associated with that for the buses to communicate to the ramp meters. Um, the transit improvement project is going to have technology at the share mobility hubs. An advanced technolo technology project is going to have the entire integrated corridor management system for the entire project. And so it's really key to make sure that those systems kind of become a system of systems and not necessarily focus on ind individual projects. And then similarly on the quarter-wide support services, um, that's really making sure that you have engineering, environmental, and survey and those and the kind of those other disciplines, making sure that those those key disciplines are looking to make sure that those co any conflicts. So, for example, if there's a foundation that's being constructed in the um, advanced technology project, well, we want to make sure that foundation is not going to be conflicting with something in the northbound express lane project. So, having those having someone overseeing the the technical aspects to make sure there's no conflicts happening among the projects since they're all being delivered concurrently. And so similarly, we're doing that on the Caltrans side, and that's going to be part of that program charter and the master co-op agreement with Caltrans. So that was kind of the vision of developing this integrated, innovative team. And so, so we issued an RFP 18-6 on January 11th and of this year, and that's really to help identify and guide the overall seven strategies and realize the goals of the entire program. And these are the, some of the disciplines I just described, uh, quarter management, public engagement, travel modeling, system management. And so... The key about this RFQ is this essentially was a menu to consultants to really choose which disciplines they wanted to actually select and, and, and submit proposals on. So it really provided a lot of opportunities. And in, and in the end, we actually received 18 proposals for all these various disciplines. 
So real quick on the quarter, quarter management, so this discipline is really responsible for the oversight of the strategic development team and overall delivery of the program. The public engagement, this is really, I wanted to point out a real unique aspect of this, of this, of this scope. We're actually going to conduct a travel behavior research and evaluation, and so that's really looking at the corridor and really understanding what are people's needs and expectations for quality of service to really obtain the mode shift that we're looking for in the corridor. So uh, this project has kind of set a goal for 10% mode shift, and so what do we need to do? What are some of the, the actual things, uh, expectations the public's looking for to induce that travel behavior? And then this is the traffic demand modeling. And so another key aspect to this scope is, is really modeling first and last mile. Typically when you do traffic modeling, usually you really focus on the freeway corridor and modeling first and last mile in terms of looking at what your mobility options are going to be has really never been done before. And so we, we have found a new tool um, that, we, that will help us model both the corridor and also integrate that with first and last mile uh, modeling in terms of you know, what your ridership and what transit and the shared autonomous vehicles and, and all these different mobility options will be available. How did that all integrate together to really help reduce trips along the corridor? And then alongside that will help us determine and identify the key performance ind indicators to measure the performance of the overall program and evaluate the success of the project. The system management is, um, as I described, is really there to develop and integrate a coordinated operations systems of systems of the entire project through the development of a program concept of operations as well as integrating the different systems um, from all the various different projects and components. And then quarter-wide support service, I described this a little bit, but this is um, really looking at taking a lot of value and making sure that we have you know, one point of contact for right away. So we've all these pre all these projects out there. We want to make sure that there's really clear communication on um, making sure there's one person for right away, one person for utility. So that way, these the utility companies are not getting confused about all the all the different project um, utility coordinators contacting utility companies on the corridor. So that's another aspect of this of this project. So we evaluate all the consultants. Um, it, maximum score was 100 points, and it was weighted 60 percent and 40 percent. Um, of the total score. The evaluation panel consisted of representatives from CCTA, designated representatives from Transpac, SWAP, Caltrans, and MTC. And so through this entire evaluation, which I have to say it was a huge undertaking, um, there was a lot of work put in, to, put in from all the staff, especially Brian, our designated contract manager, um, and kind of keeping us all straight and organized in terms of uh, conducting all of the evaluations with all of the, the team members. Um, we actually conducted separate evaluation and separate evaluation teams for every single discipline. We had separate interviews for every single discipline. And we ultimately, after the evaluation is complete, um, uh, staff is recommending these consultants for each of the disciplines. So discipline one, quarter management, we are recommending WSP. Discipline two, convey. Um, discipline three, DKS. Discipline four, WSP. And discipline five, we are still in the process of, ne of negotiating those contracts. Um, for discipline five, and we'll bring those to the authority board in a future meeting. So our recommendation is um, st staff seeks authorization for the chair to execute agreement number 530 with WSP and the amount to exceed $5 million to provide program quarter and system management services, agreement number 529 with convey and the amount not to exceed $1.3 million to provide public engagement services, and agreement number 527 with DKS and the amount not to exceed $1.4 million to provide traffic demand and modeling and traffic operations. So that concludes my presentation. And Happy to take any questions. Tim, this is an exciting project. Mm -hmm. This is really, this is a unique organization chart because it's a unique, we've never done anything like this. Um, I think just the excitement, I see the enthusiasm in your presentation. Um, I'm also glad to see DKS. I think their traffic modeling, I think these guys are really, really good at what they do. Um, and obviously to the 680 and this concept of going out and trying to actually find out what people are doing. I don't know how we're going to do that, but I'm really looking forward to that. Um, that I think is, uh, we, we have a tendency to count cars and see cars moving, but we don't understand why they're doing that and, and that background. So, um, you know, I think absolutely we should recommend this to move forward in all three contracts. And again, I think this is going to um, put shed a lot of light on our agency to see the success of this project, what we come out of it, 
uh, not only in the information we gather, but the solutions we come up with, which I have no idea what they're going to be, but uh, exciting. So I'd move the item. Second. I have a first and a second for, for a call for the vote. Uh, <clears throat> comments here. Um, to me, as you presented, it's very complex. There's a lot of a lot of stuff going on, and and a lot of it will be simultaneously going on. So, my recommendation for you to put in the back of your your um, brain back there is that as this proceeds updates to the board because this is so unique that it would be really great to know kind of what's going on because this is uh, I, and I don't know we have a determination dates do we have timelines yet or is that to come so the overall schedules will will be coming um, and once we get the corridor manager on, on board they'll be able to kind of bring a cohesive schedule among all the projects and all of the activities and that's where I'm trying to get at the updates to the board because as this thing uh, proceeds you're talking 2025 right well <clears throat> some might not be here <laughs> yeah, we, uh, uh, I'm talking the board and a few few other things so I think uh, to have everyone kind of on board as 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 it changes because you know so you understand where I'm, I'm looking towards the future also so it's a really good question and comment um, we are actually anticipating on having not only staff but Caltrans um, provide regular updates to the Authority Board um, on the progress and development of the project and we are we've been talking about having either monthly updates depending on the number of activities that are going on or at a bare minimum at least every other month um, yeah. to make sure everyone is aware of what's going on as we continue to because we're at a point where the foundation set and we're like we're like ready to set and go and this was kind of the last piece to that and so we plan on having regular updates to the Authority Board okay and then one additional comment and I think my partners We'll, let, we'll go with this. Like with the city now, uh, Brentwood is devised. We put, when something starts, we do not try to change the director of that. We keep that person the whole time. Well, this has got a lot of moving parts. So we kind of want continuity and, uh, you know, all of a sudden you got a new person and doesn't know what the hell's well, going on. Stay here is what he's saying. Oh, well. <laughs> That isn't going to happen, but uh, like you like that, I, I'm sure. <laughs> anyway, th those are my comments, and uh, I do have a first, and I do have a second. I do have a question. So, so, oh, oh I and just, you had a comment. I'm sorry, Teresa. So I agree with all of this. This is very exciting, and have um, I have been hearing about it in a number of different roles. And as we're doing updates, I think the other thing is um, – as we go out as um, commissioners to speak to people, our constituents and others, sort of some simple talking points as we go forward um, that just break that down in layman's term and sort of what we're doing here um, would be very helpful. And then for our outreach, uh, I'm tying on to her, for our out outreach with the press, et cetera, because this is going to create chatter. Uh, I'm not quite sure which kind of chatter, but it is going to create. So we, it would be good uh, to know what's going out there, too. Pardon me? It, it's going to create crunchy Brentwood corn chatter. I love it. Uh, <laughs> how in the world did we get corn into this? Side? Okay. Anyway, <laughs> then, then I'll say it like this. We need the ear of the people, so that would be... Uh, the last thing. I, did I call for the vote? No. Nope. Call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Correspondence, news clippings? Uh, close the meeting. Anybody got anything to say? Adjourn. Thank you. No, you got to go. <laughs> <laughs>